The Suffering is a third and first person action horror game developed by Surreal Software and published by Midway Games in 2004 for PS2, Xbox, and PC. Before its rather brisk production, the creators would hand in a two-page pitch for a stylized horror shooter that would combine the frenetic action of Devil May Cry, the atmosphere of Resident Evil, and the immersion of Half-Life. Though I can't for certain say that concept is what made it to store shelves, The Suffering was kind of a hit. It was reviewed relatively well and sold enough to warrant a less profitable sequel. The failure of its sequel and of Midway's other releases would stamp out the developer's aspirations for further installments, and a planned film adaptation. The franchise's future quickly nosedived and Surreal Software would eventually be absorbed into Monolith. With their only other planned game, an open-world GTA clone set in Las Vegas, abandoned mid-development. Which is a real shame because clearly they were working on some groundbreaking shit here. We've taken the club from dead hopping. The Suffering came out at a time when horror games were having a bit of an identity crisis. A vocal majority of critics thought the genre had become stagnant and saturated in sequels and clones. So Midway really went out of their way to market The Suffering as a wholly new and visceral experience that draws from horror films and American history. Genre staple Resident Evil was dabbling in multiplayer titles that were met with mixed reviews. Other games like Obscure would attempt something similar while meeting equally mixed results. Doom 3 would revamp the original story and visuals but leave many underwhelmed with bland and predictable action. Silent Hill The Room, Team Silent's last outing, was released to lukewarm responses as it deviated strongly from the rest of the series. Because of this deviation, Konami would predictably disband the development team because... <laughs> what, what do you like, games, you f***ing nerd? GIVE ME YOUR MONEY! In a fictional Alcatraz-like prison called Abbott State Penitentiary on Carnate Island, a voiceless inmate named simply Torque is being escorted to his cell on death row. We overhear the guards express their disdain for him, the other prisoners, and the prison itself, gossiping about Torque's alleged crimes, mainly murdering his own family and claiming to have no memory of what really happened to them or if he was involved in their murders. With the exception of one, his fellow prisoners seem just as dismayed by his arrival. Right from the top, we get an idea of what the suffering wants to say about prison in the United States. It's archaic, dehumanizing, unpleasant, and unfair for all involved. Both the guards and prisoners just have to fester in constant hatred and resentment for one another. Torque hasn't been in his cell for more than two minutes when an earthquake hits, causing the power in the cell block to go out. The rest of Death Row starts getting picked off by a strange creature with blades for limbs that appears out of the darkness, but Torque is mysteriously spared. We quickly learn that all over Abbott, things have erupted into chaos, with a variety of grotesque monsters attacking guards and prisoners while they are already clashing with each other in the anarchy. While trying to fight our way out of the prison, Torque experiences a number of hallucinations and visions that shed some light on Abbott's storied history with brutal acts of violence. Each creature is a grim reflection of one of the heartless ways people were executed on Carnate Island. Along the way, three figures from Abbott's history will appear in attempts to either help or impede your progress. Hermes, the prison's former executioner, and Horus, a prisoner who was driven to a murder he regrets. These two act as the angel and devil on Torque's shoulder, with the former tempting him to give in to his suppressed hatred, and the latter imploring him to escape the same fate that befell him. The third is a man named Dr. Killjoy, who appears only with the assistance of vintage film projectors, who is fascinated with Torque's ability to transform into a ghoulish creature when he is angry, and uses vague pseudoscientific methods in attempting to cure him. The ghosts of Torque's family will also show up to either taunt, lament, or encourage him as he interacts with other survivors and navigates the prison and other areas on the island. Characters show up that you can either murder or join forces with. Your choices in this matter affect a simple morality system that determines the game's ending. There isn't much of an incentive behind killing people that could otherwise be allies, unless you just want to avoid plot at all costs. Bigger picture ideas of the game's story like the reality or psychological metaphor of the monsters, Torque's ability to become one, and the truth about his family's murder are variables and not the focus as much as the atmosphere and lore surrounding the prison. 
I can see them trying to play to both sides, but it also raises a number of questions that are clearly not important to the developers. Perhaps for the sake of making the game a singular experience that doesn't require but is open to sequels. There are a lot of diaries and bits of history that you could indulge in or completely ignore, but to ignore them would be ignoring what sparse story this game has to offer. Ultimately, the strongest card in the Suffering's deck is that it's a good idea. There are a lot of aspects of it that I really enjoy, like its willingness to play with campy 70s exploitation ideas alongside some really dark and gritty story beats. The mere idea of Horus, Hermes, and Killjoy are all games within themselves. I don't really know how I feel about Torque as a character. He's not enough of a blank slate or fleshed out character. The story hinges on him and the revelation of his character. Is he a family murderer or not? Is he crazy? Does he have powers? How am I supposed to relate to him? I know I wouldn't do what he did. I've listened to too many true crime podcasts to know that a blackout is never a solid alibi. I would've just ran. I mean, fuck it, what's keeping me here? <laughs> Out on that open road? I was born to run. There are a few moments where the atmosphere is just right, and I felt a twinge of tension, perhaps some intrigue, but these were mostly in the game's earlier moments, and a good two-thirds of it can feel like a slog, where you only pick up on the faintest wisps of plot. All the trappings of a horrific, gruesome game are here, but it so rarely seems to want to play as horror, or it just doesn't know how to. Its well-designed creatures just kinda saunter out with little build-up, and flashes of the prison's history don't feel like they have any purpose other than startling you with violence. Its setup is like an early Silent Hill game that continuously misses every softball opportunity to do something meaningful or effective. Obviously, there are many who would either disagree or not be bothered by this, as any review on any platform will have very little to criticize about the game, and many will claim it to be the most horrifying game they've ever played. The reviews that don't like this game don't like a fear or a scare atmosphere. This game was great, period, for the non-wimp crowd. I have been playing for 20 years, and this is the scariest video since the Silent Hill series. Resident Evil does not hold a candle to this. Reviewers that had comments on controls, weapon management systems, etc. just don't get it. You buy this game for the scare and atmosphere factor, which cannot be beat. If you want super controls, <laughs> stick to Ratchet and Clank. This game's for the big boys, and not the wimps. See, that's rock solid. I have no rebuttal to that. I think I might just be a wimp. I'm not a big boy. I'm a little boy. I'm just a little critter. But you know, ultimately this boils down to preference, and it just didn't resonate with me. But if you like spookiness for the sake of spookiness, I'm sure you'd find a lot to appreciate here. And I hope that came off uh, as condescending as I meant it. Lead writer, designer, and Guitar Hero shirt owner, Richard Rouse III would elaborate on the game's design in a post-mortem after the game's release, explaining their attempts to differentiate themselves from the Resident Evils and the Silent Hills. Stating, we were going to focus more on combat and avoid the long cutscenes, frail central characters, clumsy controls, fixed camera angles, and sparse ammo of many console horror games. In other words, most things that you'd find in an effective horror game. Being a combat-centric game, The Suffering would undergo substantial changes in its mechanics. Originally planned to have a targeting system in the vein of Siphon Filter. A year into production, the success of games like Silent Fuck. I'm sorry. The success of games like Max Payne and SOCOM would influence them to opt for the aiming freedom of PC shooters. The disconnect between the gameplay and combat was resolved and creates a rather fluid and comfortable shooter experience that could have been greatly improved by a touch of variation. Frantically strafing while emptying shells into waves of creatures is nice, but its tedium is quickly felt. You can pick up twin revolvers, a shotgun, curiously a tommy gun, casting uncertainty on the game's temporal location. As per the design philosophy, there is no scarcity of ammunition or healing items, and they show up in neat piles in just about every corner of each environment. Killing enemies increases a rage meter that can be expended to turn Torque into his monstrous form for a short period, where you can lumber around killing enemies in a single swipe. 
It's fun because it's a break from running and gunning, but it rarely seems all that necessary. I probably used it three or four times throughout the whole game, and at least two of those were mandatory. There were some thrown weapons like grenades and molotovs you can use, but outside one specific enemy type, I didn't find myself needing to call on their services either. Most things in this game can be solved by shooting. If for some incomprehensible reason you run out of ammo, there are two melee weapons you can use. I don't see why you would though, because you got guns. But alright tough guy. There are around seven different enemy types and each require a different method of shooting. One you gotta shoot in the head. One you gotta wait until it comes out of the ground to shoot. One you gotta wait until it appears from goo to shoot. One you gotta wait until it comes out of the ceiling to shoot. And one you just gotta shoot. The Inferna, or little girl witch enemies, were probably my favorite because they just do the most. They dart around quickly leaving trails of fire. They're the only enemy I never quite nailed down a simple way to kill. You might have noticed a lack of footage of me playing in first person, which you can do and it's a perfectly fine way to experience the suffering. There's just something off about it, it feels a little slidey, a little floaty, plus I feel like it loses a layer of atmosphere, like it's one step closer to being an arcade light gun shooter. Also, you just kind of get too good of a look at how blocky and silly things look up close. Yeah, don't just stare at it, eat it. You'll come across some nice logic-based puzzles that aren't particularly difficult to understand, but are well integrated, and certainly a cut above dealing with gems and crests and esoteric security systems. You gotta put this fire out, so turn the sprinklers on and block the drain so the room will flood. I get that. I like getting things. At several moments, you'll come across NPCs, like a guard or a fellow inmate, and you can choose to team up with them. They breathe a lot of life into moments that would otherwise be dead silence punctuated by shooting. They obviously are never as much of a badass as Torque, so you often have to babysit them. It became routine that whenever I lost sight of them, I just had to accept that they were probably dead. And you know, it, it didn't, entirely, uh, didn't entirely bother me because none of them are that great company. But still, it was nice having someone around. That sounds really nice to have someone. Having someone I can count on. I'm not opposed to a game like this, but where other games might get away with a straight shooter experience because of an immersive story, world, or atmosphere, or just having an infectiously fun gameplay experience, The Suffering doesn't know how to properly utilize those things outside the first area, and reviews that claim it does utterly confuse me. Like, that's a strong opening. The build-up to the creature's reveal is tense and creepy. The dialogue between prisoners is gross. Your lawyer, fuck you. Explicit and gross. Baby raping! It feels like a, an unpleasant place to be. You know, then the rest of the game seems to forget how to do that. It's a solid experience. I don't have any quibbles about the control, aside from getting stuck in the environments a couple times. <laughs> One idea that was clever but doesn't get enough time to shine is the monster's aversion to light. A few of the waves of enemies can only be stopped by using the big high-powered spotlights around the prison's perimeter, and I feel like that's too interesting a characteristic to give them to have it be barely relevant for most of the game. What's up gamers? You already know who it is. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Look, I'm outside right now. Uh, just wanted to clarify, uh, I looked it up and the Slayers are the only enemy that are affected by light. So, um, just wanted to set the record straight. Uh, glad I caught this preemptively so it didn't turn into a Beckett is a werewolf situation. But just wanted to make it clear, I goofed and, um, I'm working on bettering myself as a human being. And I hope you have a great day. Please remember to... Smash that motherfucking life. So much hype was built over its morality system, which boils down to kill people or save people, and then get an ending that seems appropriate for whichever you did. Even if the gameplay was kind of uneven or awkward, I, I would have respected it for trying something. And you know, it feels okay to play. I yeah, I'm just the kind of... Fuck. That needs more to hold my attention. If this is all we're gonna be doing, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need a little bit more. If you overload me with monsters and the means to kill them, the horror is dispelled. It's it's going by too quickly. There's a monster here. There's a monster there. I'm asleep. I'm gone. I've disassociated. I'm outside my body. I'm in alien form, observing myself, not being all that impressed by a game. The Suffering was an appropriate looking game for the era. It wasn't blowing anyone away, and due to its setting it really didn't allow for environments beyond grey hallways and open fields. It looks nice enough, has some neat lighting, but a lot of its graphical shortcomings were made up 
by its inventive enemy design, which were created by the developers and then expanded on by the team at Stan Winston Studios, who have been responsible for a number of iconic film special effects. Some of them are really interesting. I think the strongest image out of all of them is the most reoccurring. The Slayers? Duh. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not a good name that you should have given them a different name. They are the most nightmarish to me because everything about them is threatening. The way you are alerted to their presence by the slowly approaching metal clank in their walk. How they skitter on the ceiling to avoid your attacks. It's fantastic. The other ones seem kind of goofy to me, but in a good way. I like the mainliner's syringe eyes and the visceral image of one latched onto you trying to drive its fluorescent green needle into you. The concept of what they are and what they represent is still clever and interesting to see brought to life. It's still a million times more interesting than the standard horror fare at the time. You know, zombies, demons, Eric Sparrow. There are also several little bits of visual flair that I appreciated, like the abundance of blood that torque can be soaked in, and the idle animations that change depending on what's in your hand. These range from just, you know, striking little badass poses to pulling out a photo of his family and just reflecting. That single little bit of gratuitous programming meant a lot to me. That's an adorably sad detail. Wow, you miss your family. I didn't know you cared about anything. Voice acting is pretty solid across the board. Some of the inmates have trouble pulling off a convincing tough guy attitude. Now, as you got cojones, you show your dirty face in front of me. The villains are having a great time chewing the scenery. Very good. We've made a lot of progress today. Uh, but be careful. A good thing only lasts so long. They're just infectiously fun to listen to. I have a particular fondness for a guard with a Russian accent who decided to lock himself in the asylum that the prison shares an island with. I hear the sounds. Boom, crash, ah! I've seen some things through the doorway there. Things I don't want to see again. He just wants to hang out and smoke and listen to music and wait for the whole thing to blow over, and he just keeps rambling for what seems like forever if you stand next to him. The worst thing about the voice acting is just the game's tendency to have dialogue eat over dialogue. If someone is talking and you trigger something or go near another source of dialogue, they will both just keep talking at the same volume, and it turns into an indecipherable mess of voices. This shit goes back to the some shit out of base on this. Hey, talk. Hey, talk. At one point, the NPC I had following me is supposed to strike up a conversation when I entered this room, but I did so a little prematurely during a boss fight because I wanted to man this turret, and he just starts he just, and he just starts rapping with me like while I'm in the middle of a firefight. That's one CEO I'm glad to see. Dead. Then all bad. But Hargrave, he was one twisted individual. <laughs> My favorite thing about the suffering is how it sounds. The eerie ambience of the prison, muffled rain outside, faint whispering. It's great! Do you even hear those little foot slappy sounds? It's good shit. I don't know how isolated an incident it is, but this GOG version had a reoccurring bug where weapon and enemy sounds would drop out for a couple minutes. The sound design was made in tandem with its soundtrack, as both rely heavily on found objects. And this game really sings when you're in the midst of a fight with thunderous, tribal yet industrial percussion. The music is built from a collage of metallic scraping and pounding, steel and stone, it feels tactile and primal, and perfectly evokes its setting. Several of these tracks are genuinely listenable outside of the context of this game, unintentionally tapping into the sounds of throbbing gristle, muslim gauze, and nurse with wound. The lengths the composer went to pair the music with the world of the suffering is really impressive. The fight with Killjoy brings in the sounds of a scratchy Victrola and distant, anguished screams. The fight with Hermes employs compressed air to play off his gaseous form. A lot of the drone and ambience was created with an instrumental sculpture called a Staminphone, which is this absurd mess of metal and strings that sounds exceedingly ominous. I'm unsettled, and I love it. More unsettled than when I'm just playing the game. 
While some critics would praise the suffering's evading of survival horror tropes, it feels like a production that revolved around realistic goals. What can we create that will probably make a nice sum of money and isn't so complicated from a mechanical standpoint that it would be difficult to pull off in a year or so? It's got the framework of a vaguely interesting story with a world around it that seems more intriguing, the blurred lines of the psychological and the supernatural intersecting, and the still lingering mystery of its protagonist. It just doesn't feel as important as it should be, it all feels thin. The gameplay is a straightforward shooter experience to a fault. I don't think what they were aiming for is all that conducive to tension and atmosphere. It's hard for me to be creeped out and yet also feel like a dual-wielding badass that can easily dispatch hordes of the same creature until I'm doused in viscera. Maybe this works for some, but I was really straining to feel the horror here. I would catch glimpses of it in the more claustrophobic areas, but it was so fleeting. A review written for PlayStation Magazine would open with, One of the most interesting things about The Suffering is that it's not a survival horror game, but it should have been. Which is appropriate because everything about it wants to be terrifying. Its gameplay is just working so hard against it, over-preparing you, over-explaining to you, and throwing swarms of enemies for you to mow down. It's relentless when it should have shown restraint. Even when I try to take my time walking through an area without enemies, if you linger in one place too long it will randomly throw jump scares at you, in the form of a still image popping up on screen with a loud noise. The biggest thing this game has going for it is its design. Creatures are really imaginative and well thought out, the music and sound outshine everything else. It's ultimately a likable game that was perhaps overpraised due to its fortunate release date, but we've since had far superior experiments in third person horror. Yeah, Alan Wake, the, the Dead Space games, well two of them, the Evil Within series, the impressive return to form from Resident Evil. You get the idea, you know what video games are, I don't need to fucking talk down to you. I, I, I don't like being this critical of a game, it certainly has its strengths. I, I, I don't know what to tell you, I, I'm a picky bitch, I like, I like stories, I like characters, I like tension, I like getting a little spooked. Uh, none of those things seem to come together for me on this one. I mean, I don't relate to this guy. I, re I relate to frail characters. You know, people that might put up a fight, but they're gonna be scared. They're gonna cry a lot. They're gonna stumble, they're gonna trip over a tree branch when they're running away from a monster. That's me. I'm that guy. I'm, I'm, the, one, I'm the one that goes out first so the hero can go on and save the day. No, I feel like that's giving me too much credit. I'm like the one that dies off screen and then like they stumble upon the dead body. Anyway, thank you for watching my video. And an extra special thanks to Ailing Uncle, Resurrection, Heather Ann, Game Master, and Bayard Brown for donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. I'm gonna whisper this here so none of the other patrons hear this, but I, I, I like you a lot. Don't, don't let the other ones know that I told you that though. You're, but you're extra special to me. I mean, like they're they're really cool too, and I appreciate them. But like. This time, it's not my best I've severed the link and killed the rest It's like that film, you know the one The worst reality, a black yarn unspun I felt it crack, a velvet neck Covered in sweat, I know I'm a wreck this ain't the one